this week's webinar. So uh, this is brought to you by GEMA Live. I'm your presenter, Julia Griffith, and today we are going to be focusing on a two-part series on diffusion treatments. Uh, and today's main topic is going to be the titanium diffusion within sapphires. So uh, for our learning objectives in this session, firstly, we're going to talk about what diffusion is and also how we define diffusion treatment. We're going to talk about the mythology of how this is performed on these stones. And then lastly, we're going to talk about identification. And like many treatments, mainly the identification is with, within observation. So I've got lots of photographs to show you as well. So to start off then, what is diffusion? So the scientific definition of diffusion is the movement of atoms or molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So all the atoms may be together and they're just diffusing and spreading out across an area. Now, when we're talking about diffusion treatment within gemstones, we're a bit more specific because we're actually not referring to any movement of atoms that might already exist in the gemstone. We're specifically referring to the diffusion of external elements inside the gemstone. So this is the definition, the diffusion of external elements into the gemstone during heat treatment. And the result of this is actually two main things. Uh, the main one is actually that it alters the color and there is uh, some occasions where also it can induce asterism, so also affect optical phenomena. In gemology, we do have two exceptions to these external elements coming in, and those exceptions are oxygen and hydrogen, because when we heat treat a piece of corundum to very high temperatures, which is very commonplace and has been since the 70s, actually, uh, when we do this in an oxidi oxidizing or reducing atmosphere, we are actually letting in hydrogen or oxygen ions. So therefore, these are excluded from the diffusion treatment definition. Okay, so let's just talk a bit about the history of diffusion treatment. Uh, this was first patented in 1975. It was by uh, a couple of scientists, Sokar and Nisevich, who worked for Union Carbide. And they actually worked for the Lind division of Union Carbide, which you may have heard of before, because these are producers of synthetic corundum. And this pattern actually describes the change of color and also the uh, introduction of asterism into corundum by diffusing other external elements inside the stone during a very high heat treatment. And this was actually work that they were continuing on from um, another patent that Union Carbide owned, and that's to do with, uh, they were the ones to first create synthetic star corundum. Uh, that was in the 1940s. Uh, it was a bit of a difficult thing to do. It was a bit hit and miss. So then they were also working on trying to induce it into synthetics as well. So uh, this did induce colour and asterism into synthetic sapphires. The pattern actually uh, describes the diffusion of titanium and iron, so for the blue coloration, which is our main focus for today. But they also talk about diffusion of chromium and also diffusion of nickel. But these two really aren't prevalent on the market. And actually, in regards to the chromium diffusion, there was an article by GIA in summer 2000, yes, summer 2015 in Gems and Gemology, which um, they actually looked at some of the chromium diffused stones from the 90s. And actually, they ended up not being diffused with chromium at all. They they actually had a synthetic overgrowth of ruby on top of them. So, and I've also heard, um, I was talking with Vincent Pardo yesterday and he was saying that actually chromium, it would take so long to diffuse, it's not actually possible. So, uh, and that was information from John Emmett. So by the by, uh, chromium diffusion is not popular. Nickel, I've never um, seen myself and there's only a couple of reports and articles about it. But the one that really came onto the market and is still very prevalent today is the diffusion of titanium. And this really started uh, being seen in 1980. This is when the first one was tested by the GIA. And then these were at the time originally referred to as surface diffused sapphires. And the reason for this is uh, the diffusion of titanium or any of the other elements I described were very much 
confined to the surface of the stone only. And the patent that describes the titanium diffusion, uh, the deepest depth it goes is actually half a millimeter. So 0.5 millimeters is the deepest and from testing a lot of them are much less than that so normally a tenth of a millimeter uh, to maybe um, a third of a millimeter quite commonly so really really only uh, restricted to the surface is this coloration then uh, there was a new surge of treatment in the 1988 where actually the diffusion of heavily zoned sapphire was seen uh, before this time, the starting material was often colourless or near colourless starting material, but then they started doing it on stones that already had colour. These were typically from Sri Lanka and had these heavy angular colour zones. Now, these apparently looked fantastic and were quite hard to identify at first until you realise that even if you see zoning in sapphire, you still have to look for titanium diffusion or, you know, indications of titanium diffusion. Then, in 1989, another new titanium diffusion treatment came onto the market. This was known as deep surface diffusion, and this uh, apparently was meant to um, diffuse the colour even deeper into the stone. However, actually, all tests have suggested and come back that the diffusion in these stones is actually no deeper than anything previously. So again, maxes out at 0.5 millimetres. And uh, even all throughout the 80s, they weren't all that popular on the market, apparently. But in the 1990s, this is when they became a lot more prevalent and they still are very prevalent today. Um, you see many sizes on the market and a lot of cal um, calibrated sizes came onto the market as well. So those that are six by four, seven by five millimeters, uh, suggesting that there is also a strong demand for these stones. So this is going to be our main focus area of this topic. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about beryllium diffusion in sapphires, which came about from 2001. Uh, the method of treatment is slightly different, uh, but we are diffusing beryllium into the structure. But the observational identification is very different, which is why I'm not talking about it in this session. And I would not like you, um, I don't want you to apply the same identification methods to beryllium. Mm -mm. So we'll talk about that next week. So now fully focused on titanium diffusion treatment. So in regards to the names that you might hear uh, this titanium diffusion treatment be called, uh, you might hear it being called surface diffusion, which it was in the beginning. Then we've got these deep surface diffused sapphires. So you can hear that too. Uh, also, um, it's really from the 90s, they started being called lattice diffused because we are diffusing these elements into the lattice of the stone. We thought that this would be more appropriate or well, the trade believed it would be more appropriate. And also it was started to be called bulk diffusion in the 90s as well. Now, since um, beryllium diffusion came out in the 2000s, so 2001, uh, this was then commonly also called lattice diffusion and bulk diffusion. And sometimes people actually define the two treatments by calling the latter two phrases for beryllium, the first two phrases for the titanium. But actually, if you're researching this topic, you could get very confused if that's your definition. So therefore, to make it really clear, I'm always going to refer to each treatment by the iron that's being diffused. So in this case, titanium. So let's focus then on how these materials are treated. We'll start by looking at the starting material for titanium diffused sapphires. And our starting material is going to be colorless or near colorless sapphire. Uh, typically, these materials come from Sri Lanka. However, a large number of Montana sapphires have also undergone this treatment as well as those from other localities as well. Now the starting material is, is usually ones that haven't altered or been changed by normal heat treatments or even just high heat treatments. They're ones that seem to be resistant to change by heat only um, because that would be the preferred treatment. Uh, if that doesn't work, then they will go ahead and diffuse it with other elements. Uh, the reason that they'll do this as a secondary option is because diffusion treated stones are considered well, slightly less desirable, only slightly because this, they are a specified treatment, they must be disclosed at point of sale, and the value 
is also slightly lower. Okay. And also the starting material, this is not necessarily performed on rough, although it has been uh, noted quite a few times to be performed on rough. But normally they must preform it first or completely facet it before treatment. And the reason for that is due to the shallow penetration of the color. Because if they just treat it in the rough and then cut it, and this is what ended up happening quite a lot, um, is that the color just completely goes. And then you have some very unhappy buyers and faceters. So uh, it has to be preformed for it to then, you know, uh, take the color in well into the stone and not be polished off later. So once we have our preformed rough material, we're going to put this into a crucible with lots of powders. And these powders are going to contain our metallic coloring elements, which are going to be diffused into the stone. Uh, so it's said that the powders used are typically a mixture of aluminium oxides and then titanium oxide, which is the source of titanium and also iron oxides as well. And these stones are heated up to exceptionally high temperatures of 1600 degrees centigrade to 1900 degrees centigrade. Now they say that there's a sweet spot in between that um, I've read different figures, but usually around 1700 degrees to 1850 degrees Celsius, uh, because the hotter that the heat is, then um, the more that the lattice of the gemstone can expand and it can allow this passing through and diffusion of these sometimes larger metallic ions to come into the stone and it will also do it faster. So the hotter, the better in a way. But then I've also read that they don't wanna to go too hot because actually uh, at 2000 degrees centigrade, you're actually really approaching melting temperatures of corundum, which is 2045 degrees centigrade. So what you can actually uh, end up having is some of the powders end up fusing onto the surface, which is non-ideal. So that's your heating temperatures. Then what will happen is the powders are surrounding the preformed stone and they will diffuse into the surface. And as they come into the um, lattice of the stone, the titanium ions will actually bond and pair up with the iron elements, so the iron within the stone. And it's this pairing of titanium and iron which causes the colour blue. Now, this is a really slow process. I've got, um, that takes hours and hours of continuous heating, sometimes in multiple stages, to actually allow this diffusion to occur to a reasonable depth. Um, so as it comes in, so it's very, very slow, and actually you have all this bonding occurring from the titanium and iron. So often it always kind of stops at quite a shallow depth. Uh, if we wanted it to go any deeper, we'd have to heat it for months, apparently. But the depth that it reaches seems to be no more in anything that I've ever read of more than half a millimeter, so 0.5 millimeters. So uh, the time that it takes, well actually uh, I've read a huge range of different times that it takes to actually do this. In, in the original Union Carbide pattern, it actually says that it takes anywhere between two to 200 hours. Uh, some tests by GIA and some reports by GIA have actually suggested that it's a lot longer. So um, often they do it in multiple stages as well. So uh, they say that it's normally several stages of 40 hour heat treatments at those very high levels, which totals around three to 400 hours of being diffused with these elements. And they may have, have to recharge the crucible to make sure that there's enough titanium to continue diffusing in. But the diffusion is very slow. And apparently if you did want to go any deeper than half a mil, it would take maybe up to, I think I heard five months for it to go up to three mils in depth. So that's one figure that I've heard. Uh, when the treatment is finished and when everything's cooled down, uh, these stones have to be polished. So there must be a final polish put onto the stone. And the reason for this is that often the surfaces after this very high heat treatment is covered in pot marks and is actually um, very textured to look at, which is why they must do it on the preforms so that they can then polish it afterwards. Or if it is already faceted, they can then polish it afterwards. And this will remove some of that material from the stone. So emphasis on lightly polished, because otherwise you could just strip the color off completely. 
So what's the effect of the treatment? Well, the main effect really is this change in color. So we're actually turning colorless to near colorless material into very nice, consistent, bright, vibrant blue material. Uh, the color is limited to just under the surface, so less than half a millimeter usually, 0.5 mil. And also we can have some uh, alteration of the inclusions, whether that be the induction of rutile needles, so increasing asterism within the stone, or also due to the really high heat treatment, we're going to find that we have lots of expanded crystals and things as well, which I'll talk to you about a bit later. But here's just a picture which I uh, took from the website of the Natural Sapphire Company showing you some rough before or afters in titanium diffusion. Uh, but like I said, not typically done on rough because um, well, the color is restricted to the surface and it will come off during faceting. So people won't be very happy with that if they've been polishing it. So uh, when this is a uh, in regards to sizes that this is performed on, there's actually a huge range of sizes. I've read that sometimes they can be as small as 12 points, so 0.12 carats, uh, so just a couple of mil in diameter. And the largest ones actually can be up to 50 carats, I've read reports on. But uh, many of these would be calibrated sizes, so the very typical 6 by 4, 7 by 5 millimeters. Let's move on to identification. Now, uh, the identification, as I've already said, is going to be mainly in the observation. This is best seen in immersion. So when we use immersion, we want it to be uh, under bright field illumination, so the light coming from behind, and we want this to be diffused. So uh, this might be in, um, for example, I've got here a microscope where the iris is all open and the pot that I've used actually is this translucent white color. So that would be great for viewing uh, immersion within, but also even your flat lights or any wide flat dis diffused light, even if you needed to put tissue over it to help the diffusion could be a great light source. Uh, you can sometimes see this without magnification um, or with your loop. So, you know, you can set up your own thing. Actually, someone messaged me after my last lecture and said that they use a mag light, so a pinpoint light, with a um, bottle cap, a white bottle cap, and then uh, some liquid inside there, and that's apparently enough to test immersion. So that's great, particularly on the field. We want to use a high RI liquid. Uh, the best one for viewing the observations that we want to view is actually diadomethane, which is also known as uh, methylene iodide. And this uh, has an RI of around 1.735. I've also read up to 1.75. Uh, but this actually crossovers, crosses over in refractive index with corundum. And that's excellent because what's going to happen is Basically, it's as if the surfaces of the stone disappear completely and all you see is inclusions and also different color zoning and different colorations within the stone. It allows you just, just to look at those things. So it's really good. So this by far is the best liquid for testing a number of stones in immersion, but certainly for titanium diffusion. However, I must tell you that this is toxic, particularly for us to breathe in. So often uh, you don't see it in too many schools and things, but I've got some other suggestions for you later on in the slideshow, so don't worry. Um, and also it can be very expensive, but I'll show you some other options a bit later. So let's talk about then what we're actually looking for. The main thing that we're going to look for in titanium diffused sapphires is concentration of colors. And these typically happen along the facet edges of the material and also around the girdle of the material. So if we have a look at this picture here, which is a sapphire that's inside, um, immersed in diadomethane, you can see that actually we can see this kind of network or cobweb of color and that's actually the um, the concentrations along the facet edges which occur in titanium diffused stones. Uh, the reason that this happens is because uh, there's two reasons really. Um, one of the main reasons is due to actually the repolishing of the stone. When we repolish it this mainly happens on the facet faces leaving these concentration on the edges and also, um, there seems to be some kind of um, color element dumping on the edges as well. 
So I've read two theories for this as well. One to do with convection within the crucible, kind of dumping on those edges. And also, um, I like to think of it almost as if you've got an edge, you kind of receive a double dose at that edge. So it seems to be a couple of reasons for why you get those color concentrations there. Uh, another color concentration that you will see is around the girdle. So you wouldn't see this in natural sapphire because the color concentrations follow the shape of the crystal. So when you see it in a sapphire, you can see these darker colors just around the edge. Now, obviously these features do depend on how that sapphire was recut. If it was repolished a bit too much or too deep, it may actually remove the color from a series of facets or you know the whole thing. The same for the girdle, maybe that was polished too much. So you might not see all of these features on one stone, but it's still something you can look for on every stone. Here is a comparison, so a natural sapphire. Uh, this one you can see is again under diadomethane. We can see no relationship in the color pattern that it has to any facet edges. Uh, you can notice around the edge as well, it just has no color rim, goes completely colorless. Uh, and also we can very clearly see this very heavy zoning, but no other color concentrations which suggest that it's been treated. So with that, fresh in our minds, we're going to play a game. And this is what I like to call diffused or not diffused. That is the question. And we're all going to play together. Uh, basically, uh, I'm going to show you a picture and you're going to shout out at me whether it's diffused or not diffused. Um, but just in case I don't hear you uh, from all the way over here, on the chat room, feel free to put in your answer. To make it quick, just put in D if it's diffused and N if it's not diffused. And then we'll talk through the answers at the end. So, you ready? Here's the first one. Diffused or not diffused? Oh, the answers are flooding in already. Look at that. You know it. Well done. It is diffused. How do you know? Well, you've got these color concentrations along the edges of the facets, the color concentration along the edge. And there's an extra clue here, which I haven't talked to you about. Uh, we'd see it even clearer if we had, um, if we were able to zoom in, but we do have some color concentration in this fracture here because diffusion can skip along into the edges of a fracture. So very good, well done. Should we try another? Diffused or not diffused? There we go, they're flooding in. Yes, yes, yes. Well done, everyone. That is not diffused. So you can see here that there's no color rim at all around the edge of the stone, so nothing to suggest that it's diffused. And also we can see no concentrations of color that would relate to any facet edges on this stone. So really, really good. All we can see is the color zoning in this natural sapphire. And also look, there's a feather and again, that feather is not showing concentration of color. Very, very good, well done. Next one, diffused or not diffused? Mixed answers here. I knew it would happen. That's why I tested you with it. Yeah, a big, big mixed. Okay, this one is diffused. Very good. Uh, so. The reason that you may have got confused and thought it wasn't diffused is because there is some natural angular color zoning in here, which can occur, that can be very common, but we need to also now look for features in case it is diffused. So for here, one of the features, you can actually see there's a concentration of color along the keel here. We can see concentrations of color where facets would be. So if you can see here and here, and then of course we have this concentration of of color around the rim. Now this would not happen in natural, you know, the chances of the cut stone having this uh, concentration zone exactly mimicking the shape of the stone doesn't happen. Okay, so this coloration is linked to the shape of the stone, not the rough as it should be. So therefore it has been diffused. Now, uh, this is just a photograph. In the real world, you would be able to see this gem outside of immersion. So you would actually know exactly how it was faceted and where those facets are. So actually you wouldn't be as blind as you were in this test. So, you know, you would actually have more information to your disposal in the real world. 
Next one, diffused or not diffused? Yeah, very good, you've all got it. You know, you know, it's not diffused. Uh, what you're looking at here is a very heavily zoned, very dark blue sapphire. Uh, you, chances are they wouldn't want to diffuse this anyway because there's no point of adding even more color to this stone. It's not gonna make it better. If anything, it's gonna make it even darker, which is not ideal. But even then we do have evidence that proves it's not diffused. Uh, even though it's very dark, you can see any of these broken color zones here where it actually uh, breaks free of the dark color and is colorless. You can see that there's no evidence of the color rim there. And also uh, no evidence of any facets where it's a bit paler either. But that was a tough one otherwise, but very, very well done. Here's the next one, diffused or not diffused. It looks a bit weird, this stone, I know, but honestly, it's how it looked when I photographed it. Very, very good, everyone. It is diffused. How do you know? Well, you've got these color concentration of the facets. Here, you can actually see you've almost got whole facets that are darker and some that are lighter than the others. You've got this concentration around the girdle as well. Really good. There is another clue in this picture. It would be easier if we could zoom in, but in these cavities, which you can see, which there's many cavities, you've actually got this bleeding out of color from these cavities as well. So if you imagine you had like a flat edge and that's diffusing to half a millimeter, but then you have a cavity which is diffusing to half a millimeter, but all the way around, you actually end up having this um, bleeding out effect on cavities and fractures as well. So you can actually see these kind of concentrations of color bleeding out around the cavities and that's an extra clue. So very good. And now for the last one, the last one in our game, diffused or not diffused. You've got it. Wonderful. It is diffused. So uh, this is nice, easy one, really, because it's showing you that wonderful cobweb look of those concentration on facet edges and also the concentration of color around the girdle as well. So really, really good. I hope you enjoyed that game. It's what I like to play on Sundays. Great. OK, let's talk about identification a little bit more in regards to immersion. So here I've got one stone immersed in diadomethane and just on the right, I've got the same stone, um, but it's just uh, not immersed. So this is just under the microscope. And actually, even without immersion, you can often see the evidence of titanium diffusion in these stones. So you can see here that you do have this concentration of color on the facet edges. So this is enough to actually know that it's been diffused by titanium. What you don't see, so the feature that has now been taken away from you, so to speak, is the color rim, so the concentration around the girdle. Uh, that's because it's hidden under this shadow here, and this shadow is caused by the crown facets on the other side, reflecting light away from you, so not letting the light in. So these shadows are really, really common. Um, so this is, um, I wanted to show you this so that you don't mistake the shadows for a dark color rim and think that that's proof of diffusion. Okay, uh, to be able to see the color rim, you really need to immerse it in a liquid of high RI. That's really, really important. Now, um, from the last group, they asked a lot of questions regarding what liquids would be good for immersion. So uh, during my little lunch break, I just went and had a look and managed to find these photographs wonderfully from GIA, published in their 1990 article, so summer, oh, was it summer? Summer 1990, uh, but by Robert Kane, all to do with titanium diffusion in sapphires. And they have this fantastic picture, so I can demonstrate different liquids to you. So the first picture is actually showing you um, these sapphires just in air. So air technically has an RI of one. So that's our base uh, material, if you like. So uh, this shows you that shadow around where the crown facets are inclined. Here under the second photograph, this is underwater. So an RI of 1.33 approximately, if the water is 20 degrees centigrade uh, Celsius. Uh, you still see, even in water, that reflection 
of the crown facet. So again, that would hide away from you any of those color rims around the girdle. You might still see the facet edge concentrations, which will be enough, but just to warn you, if you like, not to mistake that for a color rim around the girdle. Uh, here, these sapphires are now in glycerin. So glycerin has an RI approximately of 1.47. This is not toxic for humans to breathe in and apparently cleans off the stone really well. So that could be really good to use and apparently is quite cheap as well. Uh, but just to let you know, apparently it's toxic for animals to breathe in. So watch out if you're an animal lover. Uh, but also do watch out because even here, you can see this color rim, which doesn't exist over here, and this is your diadomethane. So I'd still be careful when the RI is lower than the material you're testing, it might still not give you, you know, the exact results that you want to see. But that's a nice comparison to show you that you don't always need to use diadomethane, or there are other options, especially where diadomethane is toxic um, and expensive. Uh, I've also got uh, this picture for you. So this I just found on my phone. Uh, this is just some sapphires that I was testing to try and see if they were diffused with beryllium. Um, this is actually in baby oil. Baby oil has an RI approximately, apparently, of 1.45. So um, that can be handy. But again, unfortunately, uh, can you see that you get shadows around the edge of every single stone? Can you see that? So straight away, I knew that I was restricted here in my observations and I couldn't really conclude from this immersion test. So again, another warning. Uh, here, here, this one, I think it had a deeper crown. Uh, you can see that it's really showing shadows. So again, limiting my view. But just to let you know, I've done even more research because it was such a big question in the last session. Um, there might be some other options out there. Uh, I found that cassia oil, cassia spelled C-A-S-S-I-A, -S -S um, this only costs a few pounds to maybe 20 pounds online. I did a quick Amazon search and this apparently apparently has an RI of 1.58 to 1.6. So that could be really good. So maybe try that. Also Canadian balsam, RI of apparently 1.53 to 1.55. So there are options out there. So um, yes, if you want to immerse. But otherwise you don't always need to immerse. You might be able to see what you need to see just in air. This is actually a picture that I took of a necklace that contained about 10 or 20 of these sapphires. It was easier to see the features on some more than others, but there was enough of them that showed these concentration of colors along the facet edges. And also, I've got a picture of this feather here later. This uh, feather also shows concentration of color. So I'll show you that in a bit. So just to summarize then our identification so far for faceted titanium diffused stones, uh, the main thing is those concentrations of color. So you're going to see these along facet edges or on whole facets themselves, around the girdle, along the keel, so the long part of the pavilion at the back of the stone, and also inside fractures and feathers. And here, this picture shows an excellent concentration of color in a fracture. Uh, the reason that this happens is if you can imagine a fracture, a very, especially an open fracture to the stone, is basically um, two surfaces with a very thin layer of air on the inside. And when you're diffusing, uh, the stone with titanium, that's basically a shortcut into the stone. It goes into the stone and diffuses into those two surfaces, either side of the fracture. So you end up with this concentration of color there. So that's a really uh, key feature. So you see it in fractures, feathers, and cavities as well. Uh, this is your main identification for titanium diffused stones. In regards to gemological testing, Actually, for these stones, your spectroscope still shows your iron line sometimes, which is very consistent with natural blue sapphires. Your um, pleochroism apparently is the same. The UV responses apparently is the same for either natural or heat treated sapphire. So none of the gemological tests that you do will actually help you define this treatment. It's all in the observation. So let's just have a look a bit more at some of those pictures close up, starting with the bleeding of color into cavities. So here I have my cavity and it seems to have lots of feathers around it as well. And we have this extra blue coloration um, concentrated around this cavity. 
Here we actually have some fractures. This is within a star piece of corundum that's been diffused. And again, there was, well, there's lots of fractures on this particular piece, but you can see that along those cracks, you actually had these concentrations of color here as well. This is showing you the concentration of color within a feather. Um, you don't see this in anything else, so no other treatment. But when a stone has been titanium diffused, if there is a feather near the surface, you end up getting this bleeding of coloration within the unhealed part of the fractures uh, or feathers. Um, so really cool. So here's a close up. So uh, these are your liquid feel filled areas which didn't heal within the feather and you can see they've basically been dyed blue from this diffusion treatment and then you get some patchy areas and I just think that's so cool and absolutely diagnostic of this treatment. Also something that you might see just to let you know you may actually get bicolored sapphires so you might have different colored cores. Uh, this only happens if the starting material has a different color to blue so for example in this picture that you started with a yellow piece of corundum that was diffused and so you can get these um, multiple or bicolored sapphires. That's not in any way diagnostic or um, indicative of the treatment just to let you know they exist. Okay, so uh, moving on with identification, just want to talk to you about cabochons a bit because we've spoken about faceted titanium diffused corundum, but when it comes to cabochons, these are a lot harder to identify because our main feature, which really was the concentration based around the cut of the stone, so those facet edges where it can, you know, concentrate, uh, they're not there anymore. So it's much harder, especially out of immersion. In immersion, you do have a chance. Uh, so here we actually have two stones that are titanium diffused sapphires. The main feature that you see first of all is patchy coloration. So rather than any angular coloration or coloration which suggests that it's in the same shape as the rough of the stone, you end up having patchy coloration due to where it was repolished. And polish can be you know, quite hard to do nice and evenly. So you end up with this really mottled coloured appearance. That's a really, really big clue to titanium diffused cabochons. Other things you might see, you might see that blue color rim around the edge of the stone, although uh, this can be polished off. But in the second uh, sapphire here, you can see that there is a darker rim. This is immersed in diadomethane. So if you're looking for this rim, uh, I would really suggest uh, to do it in diadomethane, even though it's toxic, but you really need to emit any reflections away from the stone to be able to clearly see this feature and not confuse it with a shadow. Okay, uh, other things that you can look for, um, and this is often one of the main things really, you just have to hope that they've got some fractures, feathers, cavities within them, because you'll see those concentrations of color or the bleeding out from these areas. Other indicative features for diffusion treated sapphires with titanium uh, actually aren't going to be specific towards titanium diffused sapphires. It's actually indicative of the heat treatment it's gone through. So very high temperature heat treatment alters the inclusions within sapphires. So if you see these, it means, wow, it tells you that it's gone through high temperature heat treatment and it means you should look for features of diffusion if it's blue in regards to titanium treatments. So uh, the features I'm about to show you are due to high heat treatments. Uh, we're looking at those heavily altered inclusions, for example, zircon halos. So zircon halos or these stress fractures around crystals can occur on completely natural stones. So completely unheated stones, they can occur. But when you see a zircon halo that has this whitish rim around that discoid stress fracture, that's indicating your high heat treatment. So that's actually where your crystal has expanded out, dissolved, and then recrystallized around the edge of that crack. So that's actually very indicative of the high heat treatment. Um, also, you'll notice that in some of these, uh, rather than just a crack, you've now got a healed fracture in these areas. So it's a discoid fracture that's cracked and then it's healed. And this can happen due to very high heat treatments. So another indication if it's a healed zircon halo suggesting heat treatment. Also, you might see internal diffusion features 
which I will show you a picture of in a second, dotted silk, so that's your rutile needle crystals that have partially dissolved, leaving kind of these orientated dotty lines known as dotted silk, and also expanded crystals. So crystals that have basically exploded into white puffy balls, I suppose. But let's just focus on uh, internal diffusion, first of all. Internal diffusion can happen in any uh, a piece of corundum that's been subjected to a very high heat treatment, it's not necessarily diagnostic for titanium diffusion or any other diffusion. But what can happen is if an inclusion itself contains a colouring element, such as titanium, when it's heated to a very high degree, it might actually release that colouring element into the surrounding host gem and this can cause it if it contains iron it will cause it to go blue so you end up having these kind of blue halos around crystals so uh, you can see it in titanium diffusion so if you see this you should then look for evidence that it has been diffused which is your concentration of color on the outside uh, you can see it in beryllium diffusion as well but you can see it in just normal heat treatment and this is known as internal diffusion because the elements already existed inside the stone. They haven't come from outside in. Okay, so this is a feature that you see in just caused by high temperature heat treatments. And then also you get these expanded crystals, so those white puffy balls I was talking about. So these are basically formless white things. I've never really known how to describe them, but what's actually happened is you've got an expanded, usually zircon crystal that's expanded out. It normally leaves a gas bubble in the middle and it turns into this white formless mass of an inclusion, indicating high temperature heat treatments for sure. For the end of this uh, session, because we're coming to the end now, I just want to talk to you about a couple of extra things that are titanium diffused one being synthetic sapphires which can get titanium diffused and also we're going to talk about star corundums as well so titanium diffused synthetics so uh, these have been actually happening for many years because they were first tested this whole treatment was first tested on synthetics in the 1950s and 60s patented in the 70s uh, but the first time that i've actually seen it being uh, talked about in the gem trade like commercial gem trade uh, was in a GIA article in 1992. And uh, basically they titanium diffuse uh, flame fusion, Benoit Sapphire. Uh, the reason for that is flame fusion Sapphire is the cheapest synthetic and actually it's the hardest to make. So you might ask, why do they do it? It's because blue synthetics, I didn't realize this, it was uh, the hardest to actually get right in regards to synthesis of corundum. And also, therefore, they are the most expensive to produce. Apparently, they're about 200 to 300% more expensive than an equal synthetic stone, but of different color, such as yellow or pink. So uh, due to this reason, they actually find it easier often just to quickly grow a colorless corundum ball or crystal that only takes about a day with this synthetic method. They then anneal it and do what they need to do, preform it, and then they put it under diffusion treatment on mass, which you know they have to still take a number hundred of hours to do, but then they end up with lots of blue synthetic diffused sapphires. So these are treated by diffusing titanium in the exact same way that I mentioned before. Uh, you, the identification is the exact same. So we're looking for concentration of color to the facet edges and girdle. Uh, in regards to how you would tell these apart then from synthetic titanium diffused synthetics and your titanium diffused natural origin stones would uh, mainly be in regards to the inclusions. If it has any of those altered or natural inclusions, then you know it's your natural um, or even the color zoning, natural color zoning. OK, that's your natural titanium diffused. If it lacks all of those features, well, then you're a bit stuck. OK, so that would actually be really, really hard to tell you which way that would be. But it would be likely to be a synthetic that you wouldn't know for sure without. Hmm, not quite sure how you'd actually define them, because even the fluorescence would be the same. So I'm not sure that would be tricky. There must be some advanced test. Would you want to do it at that point? I'm not sure. Uh, in regards to the pricing of these, these are tr uh, priced lower than true blue synthetics. So they are seen as inferior to 
blue synthetics that have the color all the way through and they will be priced accordingly because uh, the color is still just limited to that surface. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to talk about, so titanium diffused star corundum. So this is what the pattern was first trying to get uh, or produce, is this uh, asterism within our sapphires. And the way that they do this is actually a similar process at the beginning, but they will actually go through a stage of um, immersing it within powders that contain titanium dioxide. And they allow this to diffuse into the surface of the stone. Again, it will be limited to just about half a millimeter into the stone. And then they will have to reheat that again to allow the titanium oxide to crystallize into rutile needles. But like I said, they're restricted to that half a millimeter at the surface. Typical features of these stones, so the asterism is apparently very sharp and bright, on the stone. Uh, typically the stones have a really nice color, which can happen in nature, but of course it's really rare. So that can be an indication. And the other thing is to look for concentrations of color within fractures, cavities, and things like that as well. The one thing that I really noticed uh, whenever I've looked at a diffused, titanium diffused star corundum, is actually that often the asterism is something known as jewel asterism or known as a jewel star. And this means that there's two stars, not really shown in these pictures, so I managed to grab these from online. Uh, jewel stars do happen in natural stones. It's known as diasterism. It can happen often in rose quartz and it can happen on sapphires too. Uh, but it is something that's really notable within titanium diffused sapphires. So the jewel stars, it's referring to the bright surface star here and then a second duller star underneath, but it's caused by the same pinpoint lighting. What's actually happening here, you can uh, imagine it really. So you've got your cabochon of your diffused corundum and on the top surface, you've got this half a mil half a millimeter, which contains these orientated rutile needles. And as the light comes down, it reflects off these orientated needles, causing a star. But then as the light goes through the stone, it goes through a period of, uh, it goes through a distance where there's no rutile needles until it gets to the back of the stone. And when it hits the back of the stone, it's actually meeting an area again with a layer of these rutile needles in and then reflecting off the needles within the back of the stone. So you end up with these two separate stars, which are particularly notable when the stone ha has been cut as a double cabochon. Okay. So just to finish off, we're going to talk about the stability of this treatment. This is a stable treatment. Uh, the color doesn't fade. It doesn't get affected by heat. It uh, is fine to put in the ultrasonic and steam cleaners. That's absolutely fine. So it's a very, very stable treatment. The only problem is, is that the color is restricted to the surface. So therefore, um, unless it's recut, it's fine. If it happens to be recut, you can lose some or all of the color from this stone because the color is constricted to just that very thin layer at the surface. Why would you recut it? Well, actually, a lot of people do recut their sapphires, which is why disclosure is so important at point of sale, because I know a number of people that when they wear their sapphire engagement ring, for example, for a number of years, uh, they may want to get it recut just to neaten up any of those fatter edges that may get abraded. And if you did it for this stone, well, you uh, won't have a blue sapphire by the end of it, potentially. Uh, also, actually, just uh, when it's at the jewelers, if uh, you did have a stone like this, um, so titanium diffused stones went to the jewelers, let's say they accidentally damaged it with flux, which causes the surface to dissolve and they had to repolish it for you, again, you'd end up with a sapphire that wasn't blue. So this will lighten or completely remove the color if it is recut. So let's just go over then those uh, learning objectives that we went through at the beginning. So what is diffusion treatment? Uh, so this, these, or these, hmm, I'm going to start again. These are gemstones that have a color treatment or that have been altered in regards to their optical phenomena with the use of diffusion of external elements. So uh, that's the 
definition. This particular text written here is actually by Sibjo, and also Sibjo has this listed under their specific treatment section, uh, which just expresses that it needs to be disclosed at point of sale. Uh, the reason that it is kept separate very much so from normal heat treatments is because, um, well, first of all, it's those external elements that have been diffused in, and second of all, the color isn't throughout the stone. It's very much limited to the surface, so that can be a real issue. In regards to the method of treatment, so this was uh, achieved by heating our sapphires to really high temperatures in the presence of titanium ions and colouring elements, which diffused into the, into the stone, but only just below the surface, so a maximum penetration of about 0.5 millimetres. Often it can be less, especially when they're recut. In regards to identification, main thing is observation. We're going to look for those concentration of colours, so along the facet edges, around the girdle, along the keel, and also inside any fractures and feathers or cavities that may be within the stone. Uh, so some of those features might be best to see under high RI fluid immersion. Other things which can Oh, other things which can indicate high heat treatment, but not necessarily this treatment, but you should still look out for it, uh, would be things like expanded crystals, uh, dotted rutile needles, or any other altered inclusions which suggest a very high temperature heat treatment. And that's the presentation. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. So what we're going to do now is just do a quick quiz like we normally do. So I'm just going to launch that. What we're going to do is I'll read out the questions so that we can all hear them and take a guess as well. So uh, the first question, diffusion is, the options are the movement of elements within a gemstone, the movement of external elements into the body of a gemstone, or a coating. So select your correct answer. Whee. Okay, question number two. When, tita oh. <clears throat> when were titanium diffused sapphires first seen on the market? 1980, 1989, or 2001? Question three. How can titanium diffused sapphires be identified? Concentration of colour around the girdle, strong angular colour zoning, concentration of colour on facet edges, or colour concentrations in fractures and feathers. So select all that apply. And question number four. What are possible features of titanium diffused star sapphires? So concentration of color in fractures and feathers, jewels stars, or gas bubbles. Again, select all that apply. I'll give you just a couple of uh, seconds to answer those questions and then select or hit submit, and then we will review those together as a group. Okay, I'm gonna close this test in three, two, one, there we go. So test is closed and I'm going to publicly review these. So you should be able to see these on your screen now. Okay, wonderful. So question one, most of you got it right. Diffusion treatment is the movement of external elements into the body of a gemstone. That would be one definition for it. Excellent. Uh, it's certainly not a coating. So it is a diffusion into the stone. And question A, the movement of elements within a stone, that's known sometimes as internal diffusion, but is not classed as diffusion treatment. Okay, it's often something that comes along with heat treatment, the movement around of atoms. Okay, but they already exist in the stone. So it's not classed as diffusion treatment. Question two, when were titanium diffused sapphires first seen on the market? Correct answer was 1980. So this is when they were first reported uh, as being seen by GIA, Gem Lab. Uh, 1989 was your deep surface diffusion, which apparently actually is no deeper than any others. And 2001 is actually beryllium diffusion, which we'll be talking about next week. 
Question number three, how can titanium diffusion be identified? The three answers that were correct in here was the concentration of color around the girdle, on facet edges, and in fractures and feathers. Uh, strong angular color zoning, that is a feature of natural sapphire, however, might be seen in titanium diffusion. There is not a fe feature of diffusion treatment. Okay, and then last question, what are the possible features of a titanium diffused star sapphire? Correct answers are concentration of color in any fractures and feathers and those jewel stars, which I just showed you, which I think is super cool. So very, very good, well done. I'm just going to have to share my screen with you again, I believe. There we go. Okay. And now we are on to questions. So if you do have any questions, pop them into the chat room now. I will try my best to answer them and we'll just do a few in this section, but like normal, that, um, if you wanna hang on and ask a question right at the end, I'm happy to hang back and try my best to answering your questions. Okay, so let's see, I've just got a question here from Guran, uh, asking me about beryllium diffusion, whether that exists. Yes, it does exist. I'm doing a whole lecture on it next week. So make sure that you join us for next week's lecture. And I'll talk to you all about that and the identification features, uh, which are different to these identification features. Very important to know. Um, so please do join me next week where we'll be discussing all about that. It's gonna be diffusion full of information. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, I've been asked what price points do we see with titanium diffused sapphires, but this, just to let you know, beryllium diffused sapphires are a very different price, but for titanium diffused, it can vary. Uh, like some of the ones that I showed you were actually only um, tens of dollars per carat, really, um, a trade price. The reason for this is that they were kind of flat rose cuts. They weren't attractive stones. You know, none of them were calibrated to size. They're quite light in weight. So they can vary from quite cheap prices to maybe a few hundred dollars to carat. To, sorry, a few hundred dollars a carat. So depending on um, the size and otherwise the apparent clarity of the stone and how good it looks, it can really, really vary. But nowhere near the price of a heat treated, nice looking sapphire. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you for your question. Let's see if there's any other questions. I can't see any yet. Oh, someone's asked me how to distinguish heat treatment and titanium diffused treatment. Well, uh, it depends. So, so heat treatment, if you only see altered inclusions that suggest heat treatment, then that's your conclusion so far. You know that it's heated, but then if you also see the features of titanium diffusion, so there's concentration of facet edges and around the girdle, then you can also say that it's been titanium diffused as well. Without those features, you can't conclude that it's been titanium diffused. But with immersion, there'll always be that feature because so you will be able to see it somewhere on that stone. Okay, but very good. Just got a question here, so from David, double star on cabs. Oh, no, so actually, um, so double stars, jewel stars, you can see this on natural sapphires as well, um, as well as titanium diffused. It's just something that I've noted very commonly on titanium diffused star sapphires. Uh, the reason is, so you mainly see it on double cabochons, but if you do have this layer of needles on the top cabochon and then running around to the back, you get your reflection of the star off the top set of rutile needles, and then some of the light goes in and then reflects off the bottom set of rutile needles, meaning that you have these two stars. That can also occur on natural stones as well. So it's not, if you see it, that's not definitely titanium diffused, but you certainly want to think about it because I've seen it on most of the titanium diffused sapphires. So then you can then look for other features, for example, concentrations of color in any cracks and things like that. So it's kind of an indication that that might um, be a treatment on this stone. Uh, I've just got a question here. What's the difference between internal diffusion and 
titanium diffusion. Internal diffusion is something that can happen with standard heat treatment. It's not classed as diffusion treatment, and it's the diffusion of elements that already exist inside the stone. Titanium diffusion is this uh, diffusion from outside of the stone, elements that exist outside the stone into the stone. And these are often just restricted to the surface of the stone, particularly in titanium diffusion, restricted just to that 0.5 mil. So internal diffusion, the elements exist inside the stone already. External diffusion, which is diffusion treatment, it's external elements being diffused in. Okay, I hope that's nice and clear. Uh, would the blue halos be a diagnostic of titanium diffusion? No. Uh, so that was under the section for heat treatment features. So that is just a feature of high temperature heat treatment. So you can see that in any stones that have been high temperature heat treatment treated. However, I do notice it a lot on the beryllium diffusion stones and also the titanium diffusion stones. So if you see that, I would look for other features to confirm uh, what its treatment has been. Okay, I'm going to pause the questions there, just because otherwise I'll do it for too too long, and then we'll resume at the very end like normal. Uh, if you'd like to keep up to date with what's going on and when we open registration, do follow us on social media and our websites. Uh, we do send emails out to our website subscribers, so that's often the best way to know when things open for registration and stuff. So do follow us on juryadvisor.com for me and also gemay.com for gemay. And check out our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. We do update our stories and our posts with when things are going on. We'll end it there. But thank you so much for hanging on. Thank you for your questions. If you did want to email me privately or message me, contact me on social media or at Julia, sorry, Julia at juryadvisor.com. Otherwise, that's it. Thank you so much for hanging on. I hope you enjoyed this session. I hope you have a great rest of your day and a good week. And I hope to see you next time. Join me for beryllium diffusion. Okay, but otherwise take care. Bye.